I've got the first talk and I'm going to be looking at something that's been hitting the, the headlines recently about diagnosing asthma. Um, now I know you're all north of the border and you probably aren't aware very much of the NICE guidelines that gave us a completely different algorithm to the sign BTS guidelines. So I'm hoping to, to help you un to pick, unpick that and to understand what's behind those two different versions. My declaration of interest, I have on at least one occasion been paid to speak at a meeting on a non-promotional topic um, and I've got, I'm associated with a number of organisations that have multi-sponsorship. My main conflict of interest in the, this context is actually that I was involved with the BTS sign guideline, very much involved with the new version of the diagnosis chapter um, and that clearly does um, add a perspective to what I'm saying and you do need to know that. Because actually what I'm hoping to do is help you make sense of two conflicting guidelines and what they are telling us. The first of course is this one, sign 153, which I imagine you're all familiar with. Can I have some nods? Some body language? Yep, okay. Um, but there is also the NICE guideline, NICE guideline 80, which was launched last um, November, wasn't it? October, November time. Are you familiar with that? Or do you never even look at NICE? South of the border, it's caused quite a degree of concern because they appear to say diametrically opposite things. That's not entirely true, as I'm hoping to explain, but they do come at it from a different perspective, again, which I will try to explain for you. What I'm hoping to do is to give you a structured, pragmatic approach to making what is actually quite a difficult diagnosis of asthma. So, Let's start with a definition, and whichever guidelines you look at, NICE, BTS sign, GINA, global guidelines, there are certain features of them. One is that asthma is characterised by episodic symptoms. We might call them attacks. People are fine in between. Most people are fine in between attacks. So the first thing is that these are episodic symptoms. The second that goes with that, of course, is the variable airflow obstruction. So during attacks, they may have poor airflow, and that then gets better with treatment. Airflow obstruction is variable. Now, the third thing that's crept in over the years is some information about the inflammation, the type of inflammation that's going on in the airways. Typically, it's eosinophilic, and that characterizes most people. You'll note the words I'm using there very carefully most people with asthma. So those are the three key things that actually make the diagnosis. And I'm going to start with two overarching concepts so that if you're puzzled about somebody, just go back to these concepts and think, does this apply? The first is the asthma status and therefore the outcome of diagnostic tests vary over time. Asthma is a variable condition. And by definition, the status and the outcome of tests will vary over time. That's actually what proves the diagnosis. And it explains why, particularly in primary care, many of our tests are negative. <clears throat> How many of you tried doing spirometry on people with asthma and come up with a negative result? Would you say that's most of the time or just sometimes it's negative? Come on, let's have a, you can't, you can only be half wrong, can't you, really? Hands up for, it's mostly, it tends to be negative, even though you know they've got asthma. Hands up who thinks it's likely to be positive more often than negative. Right, you've summed it up. They are, neg it's negative much of the time, especially in primary care. Now, if you're working in secondary care, where you've got a more severe group of patients, chronic symptoms, that might be different. <laughs> <clears throat> it also brings us to this concept of active and inactive asthma that everybody in primary care will be very familiar with because that's how our quality and outcome framework registers um, were, were, were compiled. You, active were people who were on the register, had a diagnosis, but were also actively having treatment within the last year. And it's a variable condition. And our asthma registers are highly variable. This is the turnover in my practice a few years ago 20% of people with a turnover of 20% in the asthma register, and most of that 
was due to people who were active one year, and when we looked the next year, they were inactive, or vice versa. There were a few moving in and out of the practice as well. Asthma is a variable condition. Our asthma registers are moving targets. But of course, you can use that variation over time to make the diagnosis. So if you see somebody who's highly symptomatic with a peak flow of 200, and you see them a week later, and their peak flow is 500 and they're fine, you can use that to make your diagnosis. But it also means it's crucially important when you make a diagnosis to write down the evidence that you use to make that diagnosis. Because somebody in a year or two or tens time may be unable to prove it because at that time everything's stable. So write down, based on peak flow variability of 100%, as the example I gave you, based on spirometry, based on, does that make sense? The second concept is that individual tests, any test, any symptom, any sign that we might look at, influences the probability of asthma, but it does not prove, or indeed disprove, a diagnosis. There are significant false positives and false negatives to every symptom, sign, and test that we might do. If you look at the long table in the BTS sign guidelines, it gives some of the figures behind that. So the diagnosis, therefore, has to build on the clinical assessment plus, as necessary, objective tests. And with that, you should be able to put your patient that's sitting in front of you presenting with respiratory symptoms into a high probability of asthma, a low probability of asthma. That really means they've got something else. And in the intermediate, where you may need more tests, more investigation, or indeed just time to sort it out. And this is the flow diagram that you've seen. Uh, all flow diagrams, it looks pretty complicated. I'll talk you through it. <clears throat> Let's start at the beginning. The present patient presents to you with respiratory symptoms, typically wheeze, cough, breathlessness perhaps, chest tightness. This is what they do, isn't it? My chest feels tight. They put their hands just there. And what you need to do is a structured clinical assessment. We chose those words really carefully. That is not just a history, though a history is part of it. It's more than that, because particularly in primary care, we have a wealth of information about our patients stored on the computer that we can go to to look up. So have there been current attacks of these symptoms? Can you look back a couple of years and see exactly the same presentation? Of so recurrence of symptoms, attacks, fine in between. Now the patient says, I'm wheezing, or my child is wheezing. But has anybody actually heard wheeze in the chest? Patients, parents do not know what the word wheeze means. They use it in a different way. Ask them every time, if somebody says, I'm wheezing, or my child is wheezing, say, can you tell me what you mean by that? I want to understand. People use that word in different ways. Can you explain what you're describing? Studies have shown that sometimes people use the word wheeze when they mean he's got a rattly cough. So ask what it's meant, what it means. It's a squeaky, musical kind of sound. Symptoms have to vary over time, by definition. You may find that they've got, a, and may know that they've got a personal history of other atopic conditions because you've treated their hay fever or their eczema before. The family history as a GP, you may, I know my family history of some of my patients. You may know that they've got asthma in the family. And crucially, of course, there's no symptoms or signs to suggest that there's something else wrong. You know, they're not smokers starting their symptoms over the age of 45 or coughing up blood or something else that makes you think it's another diagnosis. So that's a structured clinical assessment. Look at the records. Is there a peak flow that was done during an attack maybe two years ago? And can you compare that to a peak flow when they're fine now? Because that might help you make the diagnosis. And on the result of that, you should be able to place people into one of these three categories. Let's look at an example. Here is a young lady who's wheezing after a cold. She tends to wheeze in the pollen season. She, in between, she's fine, asymptomatic. She's had a recent acute attack, and you can look back a week ago. She came in with a peak flow of 250. Her GP, who she saw, heard a wheeze in her chest. She was given an oral steroid course. You've just seen her again. Peak flow's 500, her chest is clear, and she's a non-smoker. Right. Now, here are some questions for you. Asthma is highly probable. I don't need any more information to make a diagnosis. It's highly probable, but I'd like to do spirometry and pheno. 
it's intermediate. I'm not sure I need more tests or she's probably just had a chest infection. Okay, votes for number one. Right, lots of number ones. Can we see some hands up in the um, video conferencing? Come on, you can't get away without thinking just because you're a long way away from us. Hands up for one. Hands up for two. Some twos. Hands up for three. A couple maybe. And hands up for the chest infection. She probably, in many places, would have had a 60% chance of having an antibiotic for that. So it's not a silly answer, though it's the wrong answer. Actually, what more information do you need? You've got a peak flow variability, 250 to 500, acute change of symptoms, classic story, history of reactions to pollen. What actually, how sure are you about that diagnosis? About 98%, I would think, 99%. If her spirometry is negative, will it change your mind? No. So a negative spirometry, which is what it's going to be, because she's now been treated and she's fine, is not going to help you and in fact is probably going to confuse the issue. You're just going to dismiss the result. So this is this first column where asthma is highly likely. You've got a lot of evidence to support it. What do you do? Code it as suspected asthma first. Initiate treatment. Typically that will be an inhaled steroid, though in this case, of course, she's had a course of oral steroids. Assess the response. In this case, it was done with peak flows, but you could use a validated questionnaire. You could use spirometry if you wanted to. If there's no response, if she hadn't come back better, then you've got to reconsider. On the other hand, if she's responded well, which she did, then you can code her as having asthma and record the basis on which you made that diagnosis. Then you need to be thinking about long-term maintenance treatment and ensuring that she has self-management so that she can adjust that herself. Now, this is the nice version of that. Um, I don't expect you to read all of that. Um, I'll highlight whichever pathway you go down, you have to have spirometry, pheno, peak flow charting. At the end of which, you may or may not have proved your diagnosis of asthma. NICE actually recognised that for many people you will get through all that lot and you still won't know the diagnosis. But what they actually say on page 762 of the appendices is that in their model they didn't worry about that because within a year that person would probably have had an acute attack. Then you'd know they'd got asthma. Hang on a minute. If we had an acute attack at the beginning, well documented, why do we need to go through that lot in order to get to where NICE think we could be at the end of the day? <coughs> there is a group where you can be really sure without all of that lot. There are also, of course, a group where you're pretty sure they haven't got asthma, or more accurately, you think they've got something else. What's he got? Our smoker. <sighs> He's been coming down your corridor <sighs> looking like this every day for the last 10 years. What's he got? Of course, COPD. This young lady, you know about the stresses and strains in her family. She gets out of breath, tight chested, and starts her fingers start to tingle, and she feels faint. What's she got? Hyperventilation. And this lady who's coughing all night um, also has acid reflux and is coughing because of the acid in the back of her throat. OK? Something else, not asthma. This is the difficult one in the middle. What do you do when you're not quite so sure? Well, spirometry is the test of choice at the beginning. And then there are many other things, including pheno, that you could do. And I'll talk that through with you. The question is, what order do you do these in? And the answer is, there is no evidence in the pragmatic literature to tell us which, on a practical level, is the order in which to do them. So when you're faced with that as a guideline committee, you have one of two options. You do what the BTS sign guidelines did. You sit round the table with some clinicians. We decided that there was really no evidence as to which order was best. So we've left them as options. Or you do what NICE did, which is to give all the same data, exactly the same data, to a health economist with a large brain and an even larger computer. And you say, number crunch that and tell us what order comes out. And that's what came out when they did that, was that complicated diagram. So one was created, if you like, statistically. The other was created by clinicians around a table. <coughs> 
It's up to you which one you choose. Either way, spirometry is going to be important in this group. So I'm going to give you some spirometry results. Here is Pat. She's a smoker. She's got a bit of a smoker's cough when you ask her. She's got an increase in breathlessness recently. You can hear wheeze when you listen to her chest. And she's just been given a course of antibiotics and some bronchodilators, neither of which seem to make a great deal of difference. But you do see that she's got a bit of hay fever. OK, which do you think she's got? Hands up for asthma. Uh -huh. I'm looking on the screen as well. Hands up for asthma. Hands up for COPD. Maybe. Hands up for both. Possibly. Hands up for just don't actually know at this point in time. You can be undecided with a diagnosis, you know. And maybe she's just unfit. OK, actually, we don't really know, do we? All of these are possibles and the combination is also possible. So let's look at four different versions of spirometry results. Here's the first, reduced FEV1, reduced ratio, obstructive picture. OK. Reversibility, 9% and 120 mils. Diagnosis? I couldn't hear any diagnosis being told me from the computer. Do shout out your diagnosis. They're shouting out here in the um, COPD. Thank you. <clears throat> Same baseline spirometry, but now bronchodilator reversibility, 25%, 560 mils diagnosis. Thank you. <laughs> now here's another one, exactly the same FEV1, but now the ratio is actually normal or indeed quite high. Right, and the FVC is also low. This, of course, is a restrictive pattern. Can't give you a more detailed diagnosis, but it requires investigation. And this one's normal. Could she still have asthma? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Only between 7 and 17% of people with asthma in a primary care population will have obstructive of spirometry and positive bronchodilator reversibility when you choose to test it on a Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock or whenever you do your spirometry. Most will be negative. You cannot rule out asthma with spirometry. If it's positive, that's great. If it's negative, it tells you nothing. I just want to digress briefly um, into um, an issue about um, the, the ratio and what is normal and what is abnormal. I'm taking the first example from COPD, but it applies to asthma too. Now, the assumption is the guidelines for COPD tell us that we use a 70% ratio. If it's below 70%, you have an obstructive picture. If it's above, it's not. That is the ratio you're given. There is a problem with that, and that is that it is wrong. In fact, the ratio, LLN, stands for lower limit of normal. That ratio falls off, like a lot of things, with age. So on this graph, which goes from the age of 30 to the age of 90, the lower limit of normal actually falls quite substantially from about 75% to just over 62%. Now, what that means, of course, is that you will hugely underdiagnose young people, but overdiagnose elderly people. So this young man, with his ratio of 68%, has almost certainly got COPD. He's got an obstructive picture and he needs to be managed appropriately with some smoking cessation advice and managed appropriately and followed up. Whereas this elderly couple with exactly the same spirometry can be reassured they've got normal elderly lungs. And this is no minor matter. This study was done in Sweden, where they took what they choose to refer to as elderly people over the age of 60. I'm very sensitive to that sort of statement these days. Um, they took more senior people and they did spirometry on them. If you use lower limit of normal, about 10% had obstructive spirometry. If you use the fixed ratio, 23%. You're over-diagnosing your elderly, over 60 population, by 13%. That is a large number of people to put a label on and for you to then feel you need to manage and look after. Always, always use lower limit of normal. I mean, ask yourself, are they symptomatic first? But 
what is the lower limit of normal. And that is easy to find out. Our spirometers all produce some pr print out a bit like this. The, I've highlighted the readings there, the baseline readings with a ratio of 66%, and it gives the normal range here, which actually for this particular person went down to 65. So it is actually normal. Your spirometer will, of course, churn out the answer that it's obstructive. Ignore it. It's wrong. It's normal. And at the other end of the spectrum, that really matters, and we've highlighted that in the BTS sign guideline, which is that young children, if you're going to do spirometry on a child, their ratio should probably be near an 80%, 90%, because they are much younger. And you will miss a diagnosis of obstruction if you don't use the lower limit of normal. So BTS sign are now strongly recommending that you should use lower limit of normal. Um, nice, grudgingly suggest that you, if you want to, you can use lower limit of normal at the extremes of age. So let's talk about David. Is that all right? Are you clear about that? Really important message. David. Now, David has asthma as a child really minimal symptoms, though colds tend to go to his chest. He gets a bit tight when he plays squash if it's a bit of a cold day, rushing around a lot, but otherwise he's well, occasional eczema, nothing really much. He has a bit of blood pressure, but that's about it. Now you might want to do some peak flows, you might want to do a peak flow chart. If you did, it would come back looking like that. Diagnosis? Completely normal. Does that mean he hasn't got asthma? No, asthma's a variable condition, and at the moment, he is completely normal. Now, you've got a number of options, but one of them is to wait a few months till he next gets those symptoms, that cold that's gone to his chest, and suggest that he might like to check his peak flows again then. And when he does, it looks like this. Now, have you got your diagnosis of asthma? Yes, you've got more than 20% variability. So yes, he's got it. But how long did it take you? About four months. Does that matter? Secondary care clinics can't cope with that. But in primary care, isn't that a reasonable thing to do? Let's wait and see what happens when you next get your symptoms. And there's your diagnosis. You could have done pheno. That might have come up positive. How many of you have used pheno? Apart from Phyllis. Nobody. Anybody in our remote uh, uh, locations? Used pheno? Don't see any hands up. Okay. No. Okay. Let me just tell you a little bit about pheno. Pheno is fractional exhaled nitric oxide. We all exhale a little bit of nitric oxide. And it goes up if you have eosinophilic inflammation in your lungs. And this is the normal distribution curve of pheno in our exhaled breath. And what you will see, two or three things. First of all, we're talking parts per billion. So we are talking minute amounts of a chemical. And secondly, you will see that there is a skewed distribution. And it's that skewed bit that potentially is interesting. Two thresholds are described. If your pheno is below 25, then it's very unlikely that you've got eosinophilic inflammation. If it's above 50, it's very likely that you have. If it's in the middle, it's a grey area. You can immediately see the first problem with using pheno. There is a fairly substantial grey area there. And there are a number of things that affect pheno results. So if you're a, a tall man who eats a lot of broccoli, your pheno will go up. And there are other things. If you've had a cold, if you've got allergic rhinitis and the eosinophils are in your nose, and really annoyingly, if you're trying to distinguish from COPD, an exacerbation of COPD will put your pheno up. Smoking, on the other hand, reduces your pheno. How annoying is that if you're trying to make a distinction? And of course, if you take steroids, that will substantially reduce your, um, your pheno. So there are a lot of things that affect it. And it's really, at the moment, quite unclear how that fits into our diagnostic algorithm. It may have potential, but remember, what it's doing is looking for eosinophils. It is not diagnosing asthma. What's the definition of asthma? Episodic symptoms associated with variable airflow obstruction. This is just demonstrating that somewhere on the line there is some eosinophilic type of inflammation going on. 
It is not diagnosing asthma. On the other hand, what it might do, and it might have come up positive in our last David, he might have had a positive pheno, that would have pushed your probabilities towards asthma. What it does do is help you distinguish the different types of asthma. Because you remember at the beginning I was talking about typically have eosinophilic inflammation. Increasingly, we're recognizing that there are different asthma phenotypes. And what we're talking about here is that the allergic asthma is the one that has a high pheno. But there are people with non-allergic disease. There are people with late onset disease. There are people with remodeled asthma. There are people with obesity who have a neutrophilic problem. So there are different phenotypes. What may be important, and I would predict that in the next maybe five or 10 years, we shall start thinking about diagnosing asthma and then as a second step, looking for the different phenotypes. And at that point, what we're talking about here is detecting what's being called a treatable trait. We're detecting the patient with asthma who is likely to respond to inhaled steroids because they have an eosinophilic type of inflammation. Okay? Don't know where to use it at the moment, not clear how to do it, but that's what it's about when you hear about it. Does that now make sense? That diagram, yeah. the flow diagram? Good. I want to tell you just one more story and then move on to another topic. This is Brian, who is wheezy after a cold. He's a smoker, he tends to chestiness in the past, and he's had blue inhalers. Now, He's coming to see you really wheezy. He's obviously wheezy. He's not got a diagnosis before. You've got to do something. And my guess is that most of what you'd want to do is give him steroids, because it might be asthma. And if it's COPD, well, that might help that as well. You might or might not decide to give him antibiotics. Would that be about right? Yeah. And you would hopefully want to monitor that treatment. Remember, monitor uh, initiation of treatment. And look, this is what's happened to his peak flows. It's gone up from about 200 and something, just over 200, to about 300. Diagnosis? Peak flow gone up from 200 to 300? Diagnosis? Asthma, are you feeling a little nervous about saying that? Yeah. It is reversibility, all right. But actually, what's worrying you is that that's not really done very well. And is there some residual problem? Has he got COPD as well? Is that what's in your mind? OK. So you're going to want to suggest he comes for some spirometry. And here's a result for you. FEV1, 66% predicted. Ratio, 62%, which is below the low element of normal. And a reversibility, not reversible. Diagnosis? COPD here. But actually, you know he's also got some asthma. If you hadn't done that, those readings at the beginning, if you hadn't done, checked the response to the treatment at the beginning, you'd have missed that asthma diagnosis. He's actually got both. But you'd have easily missed one or other of them if you hadn't investigated it over time. Asthma's a variable condition. You have to check it over time. There's no sign of it by the time he got to your spirometry clinic. Which brings me to the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, which I just wanted to touch on rather briefly, but just to give you a thought about it. The question is, people have both. Is that because they've got two diagnoses that overlap? Is that because it's one disease, but it appears in many different ways, and therefore there appears to be an overlap? Or is it a new syndrome? Well, it was called a syndrome. They're trying to drop that word now. I think they've realized the error of their ways. But it does have its own guideline. This is the international combination of GINA and GOLD guidelines for ACOS. And their definition is that it's characterized by persistent airflow limitations. Well, it would have to be, because there's COPD there, with several features associated with asthma and several features associated with COPD. Hmm. Stating the obvious a bit, isn't it? Nevertheless, let's move on. Could it be comorbidity? After all, our young people with asthma may choose to take up the evil weed and develop COPD. Our young smokers here may go into a job that triggers their asthma later in life and have both. So that is, I would suggest, probably the most likely. Or is it a phenotype? Read this. This is from a paper about COPD phenotypes. There is a phenotype of COPD that is difficult to separate from asthma. Eosinophilia, positive bronchodilator test, history prior to the age of 40, has allergic rhinitis, lots of IgE and a personal history of ATP. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it waddles like a duck, it is a duck. I would suggest to you that that person actually, never mind difficult to separate from asthma, they've got asthma as well as the COPD. But don't be too scathing about this concept because there are phenotypes of asthma that are non-eosinophilic, that tend, in particularly in obese women, less atopic, high symptom scores, that do seem to be different and do seem to overlap. So, you know, we just got to be a little bit careful that there isn't some... I suggest that the majority of ACOS are actually overlapping common conditions, but there will be some where there's something different going on, and gradually, as we understand phenotypes of both these conditions, we'll understand more about it. And it matters because the people with two conditions with this overlap, have a lot more morbidity, it's diagnostically difficult, and we wonder what to do about the management. Why? Well, because we've got two different sets of guidelines, and which one do we follow? Well, the suggestion is, I mean, if you look at it, in asthma, we're told it's inhaled steroids and never use a larva by itself, a long-acting beta agonist by itself. If you're talking about um, COPD, it's bronchodilators and no monotherapy with inhaled steroids, and indeed only use the inhaled steroids if they're actually indicated. So we've got these two completely opposite bits of information. What do we do when somebody has both? Well, the guideline would suggest that you start with the treatment for asthma. These people are not in that category of COPD patients where we're being told we should, we're over-prescribing inhaled steroids, these people should all be on inhaled steroids for their asthma. Obviously, you're going to advise smoking cessation as you would for COPD. You're going to support their self-management as you would with anybody with a long-term condition. And you're going to promote exercise and pulmonary rehabilitation. Does that help a little bit? But the rule is, if they've got both, start with the asthma and then bring in the other treatments. The big thing is they must be on asthma doses of inhaled steroids. So just to sum that up, asthma is a clinical diagnosis. Start with a structured clinical assessment. Use all the information and use that in order to assess probabilities. Look for evidence of variability in the history. Look for variability in the clinical record and use time as a diagnostic tool. If they have symptoms, episodically see them when they've got the symptoms and when they haven't. And if it takes you six months to make a diagnosis, that doesn't necessarily matter. You may wish to look for evidence of eosinophilic inflammation, which may shift your probability of whether or not it's asthma. It does not prove a diagnosis. Objectively, when you've made a decision that it is probably asthma, label it as suspected asthma, and objectively assess your initiation of treatment. Don't just give them an inhaler, put it on the repeat prescription and never see them again. Obsess it objectively before you confirm the diagnosis. And when you've done that, record the basis on which you made that diagnosis so that somebody looking at it later who can't repeat that scenario that you were dealing with knows why you've made that decision. And if the two are coexisting, treat the asthma first. So, I hope that's helpful. I've got a few minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions. If you didn't have a pillow machine to um, check the, the, the breath, could you just do a full blood count? You can. Um, and in fact, a high percentage of adults will have a full blood count in their records anyway. So one of the bits of history that you might, that structured clinical assessment might be to look at um, at a full blood count. If the eosinophil count is very high, it pushes you towards the atopic conditions, absolutely. There is an association there. Um, it's not a test that's probably worth doing. You know, it's like all these tests. It's got false positives and false negatives. But it is worth looking to see if they've had a full blood count. If they have, it's pushing your probabilities to asthma. Uh, very quickly, what was the ACOS uh, guidelines that you cited there? They, are, um, they were developed by the GINA and the GOLD. Are you familiar with them? Those are the global guidelines. If you Google GINA, it's the Global Initiative for Asthma, and GOLD is the Global Obstructive Lung Disease. Um, but GINA and GOLD are the global guidelines, and it's on both their websites because they joined together to do that.
Um, no, it's really talkative, and I think opens our eyes up to new avenues that we can't, just can't compartmentalise respiratory diseases. And I'm just glad that we didn't call it COPD and asthma, otherwise that would have been chaos. <laughs> <laughs> but I think more importantly, bringing it back, just to simplify the message, I always say that asthma will kill you, there and then, but you may die with COPD. So asthma is the, pro the priority treatment to work with, it, and then we can start working. Yeah, I mean, I think probably what you're really saying there is that people with asthma are subject to acute attacks, episodic, variable condition. And you don't, if you've got COPD, the last thing you need is an acute asthma attack on top of it. So, I mean, that comes out the same. Thank you. For the person who only wheezes and drops their feet flow when they've got viral infection, yes. would you necessarily call them asthmatic or would you say they've got viral induced wheeze? For the, are you talking about small children? Or are you talking about adults? Oh. Um, in small children, I'm going to park the question because we've got Jimmy Patton talking to you about small children and he is going to cover, I know, that topic. In adults, if somebody is repeatedly dropping their peak flow and wheezing with a viral infection, then they've got asthma. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty black. And I would try them on a course of inhaled steroids through their next viral infection and see if it made a difference. The catch, of course, is that as an adult, you may only have a viral infection once a year. So that is a bit tricky. But yes, it is worth thinking about that is probably asthma. And you need to look back at the other stories. You would need to look back and see whether they had eczema or hay fever. Often more comes out of the woodwork when you start to explore it. If you had a pheno machine, you could do a pheno. And if that were positive, it would push you towards the probability of asthma goes up. Doesn't prove it, but the probability goes up.